An underground theory of how the Marshall Fire started. A fire underground coming to the surface. You've been trying to sign up for your county's emergency alerts like we asked. In early January, when after the Marshall Fire, when you said get online and sign up for Code Red, I did and I couldn't. Turns out it's a city county confusion. Clear it up tonight. The King Super Strike is over, and conversations with leaders on both sides gives us an idea why. Your word of thanks generosity passes $8 million raised in total for Colorado's nonprofits. This week, we're helping a small group find the funds to help some new neighbors succeed. And there's no masking everyone's good news at the stock show. Here we are again from my home to yours. This is next. The cause of the Marshall Fire could have been something older than the neighborhoods that it burned. Investigators are looking at the possibility that a decades-old coal seam fire underground may have surfaced again and started the fire that burned more than a thousand homes. The sheriff's office continues to look at a property uh, held by a religious group, but they are also now looking at an old coal mine property across the street. Let's bring in Nine Wants to Know investigator Kevin Vaughn, who broke this story this afternoon. And Kevin, these coal seam fires can simmer underground for a century or more before emerging at various points. That's right, Kyle. And this very same mine sparked a wildfire in December 2005. It didn't get a lot of attention at the time because it was relatively small, it was contained quickly, and it didn't do a lot of damage. Looking at uh, lightning caused fires or mechanical issues that spark fires or human behavior. Imagine different signatures, but not something unheard of to look for the marks of a coal seam fire surfacing. That's right. We had a big one of these in 2002 in Glenwood Springs. It destroyed 29 homes. Burn patterns will help with this investigation. And maybe they'll get lucky as they did back in 2002 in Glenwood Springs. And there's an eyewitness that saw this fire actually break through the ground. We don't know if there is one but investigators would certainly love to find that person if he or she exists. All right, Kevin Vaughn from Nine Wants to Know. Kevin, thank you. Got a smart question this week about a potential origin or contributing factor of the Marshall Fire from a next viewer, Ryan, who wrote in asking about planned burns in that area, burn off of excess vegetation in the area where the Marshall Fire got going. Those burns, of course, can prevent a runaway fire activity, but we have also seen occasions where prescribed burns in Colorado get out of control. You think back to a decade ago, the Lower North Fork Fire that got out of control and killed three people. So we took Ryan's question to Boulder County open space, which owns some of the land nearby, and they noted that uh, burnoffs in grassland areas really only tend to be effective for a year or two. It's not like burning heavier material in high country forests. And we talked to the, the city of Boulder that also has some property in the area, and they said that they last did uh, prescribed burn in that area in 2018. They mentioned that dry fall weather and wet spring weather prevented them from going in and doing burnoff activity over the last two years. So you know how we have talked so much over the last couple of weeks since the Marshall Fire about signing up for your county's emergency notifications. In Adams County, 4% of the population is signed up. Hey, listen, last night it was 3% signed up in Adams County before we rode you like a rented mule again to get signed up. But a whole bunch of next viewers, including Elena and Cheryl and Anthony and Kay and Deb, all told us they tried to sign up with Adams County last night and could not. The reason our Marshall Zellinger found out is as simple as it is frustrating. Cheryl Bueller has tried to take our advice and sign up for Adams County alerts from her home on the Adams County side of Westminster. Right in early January when after the Marshall fire when you said get online and sign up for code red. I did and I couldn't. She, like others who have reached out to us, gets the warning, the location you entered is outside of your community's code red service area. I suspect there's probably several people like me that are trying to do it run up to a roadblock and they go, yeah, I'll, I'll figure it out later. We found the issue. The areas shaded in pink are covered by Adams County code red signups. North Glen is part of that pink shaded area. Federal Heights, Westminster and Thornton are not. You see, each of these cities have different code red sign up websites. In North Glen, you have to sign up with the county. Federal Heights has its own sign up. So does Westminster and so does Thornton. Not all counties cover their entire jurisdiction. If you are a Thornton resident, have a Thornton address, then we recommend that you go onto our website 
uh, and sign up for Code Red. Ryan Doyle is Thornton's emergency manager. Thornton, which is in Adams County, has its own Code Red sign-up page, which looks just like Adams County's page, except for the logo in the top right corner. Really what you need to do is, whichever city you live in, go onto their website and see if they do have their own notification system. Once Cheryl went to the Westminster Code Red sign-up page, she got registered. Congratulations. You've been successfully added and received Code Red. I told you to look in the top right corner to see the logo that shows up. And for Cheryl, there was no logo. And underneath it, it only said Broomfield and Jefferson counties. Well, Westminster is in Jefferson County, but she's in the Adams County part of it. But she got the congratulations screen, so I, at least I'm confident, I believe, that she's in. Kyle, quick footnotes on Thornton. Adams County now has the 4% opt-in rate. Thornton is a city, 27%. Hey, that's not, well, it's still not good, uh, but it's not as bad as, as 4%. Marshall, this process, though, so many new people getting into the system as a result of the public pleas to do so after the Marshall fire is exposing the counterintuitiveness of a lot of uh, this process, which really needs to be seamless because it needs to be able to save lives. It seems odd, and I want to get to the bottom of this, why the website can't just be a come on, everybody sign up, and we'll figure it out based on your address. And I know, as we've done with the bag fee story in Denver, that you might have a certain address mailing-wise, but your physical physical address is different, so that could be a problem. But I really hope, I keep the mantra, there's got to be a better way. And if we can change the system to simplify it for the user, the end user, it's got to be simplified. Marshall Zellinger, the most persistent man I know, is on. Marshall, thank you. Here, let me get him in the car. Okay, sounds great. She's super friendly. Come on, babies. Well, since Kyle's frozen for now, I'm going to take this. We showed you this video last week on Next. Boulder County deputies going door to door, evacuating Beverly Vela and her pets. Well, the deputy helped her get her bulldog Zoe in the back of his car. And today, Vela shared a photo with us. The deputy came back way early this morning to check on her. She told me the timestamp was 6.57 a.m., uh, though she says she's pretty sure she just that the deputy probably just wanted to see Zoe again. Marshall and I are now co-anchoring the most awkward show ever, but I want to give you an update on your Word of Thanks campaign, which was the one that we paused when the Marshall fire happened so that we could turn our attention to those needs. But then again this week, what we're doing is we're helping the nonprofit Hope Communities raise money so that they can help Afghan families transition to life in the United States. They, they need specialized, essentially, uh, translator counselors who know the family's language and culture and can help them better put down roots in our community. And since earlier this week, you have raised $40,000 to help that nonprofit meet its goal. If you scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491, we'll send you that link to join me in donating so that we can help some of our new neighbors who came here from Afghanistan last year get off to a self-sufficient and successful start in Colorado. So the sidewalks outside King Supers are quiet again for the first time in about 10 days. The store and the union announced today that they reached a tentative agreement to end the strike. The union says that means that workers can return right away and they'll begin voting to ratify that agreement starting Monday. So let's analyze what likely happened with the King Super strike based on what we know happened. Here's the deal. The strike worked and it worked faster than even union leaders apparently thought that it would work. They were prepared for three weeks on the picket line and it just went into week two. And as of yesterday, on next, the union president was still drawing red lines, things that she said were unacceptable in the contract and they would not accept from King Supers. Things like a contract that could change in the future based on what they negotiate with Safeway. It would be highly unlikely if any of those red lines are crossed in the contract that will be presented to UFCW Local 7 members starting on Monday, because that's asking for them to vote it down. King Supers was clearly under quite a bit of pressure to make a deal and to do it quickly. You only had to drive by King Supers stores around the metro area to see how empty the parking lots were. Coloradans, customers, stood with the union on this and largely did not cross the picket lines. And this came at a time when staffing shortages give workers a lot of leverage. We're going to see what is in that deal when it becomes public after it's shown to those King Supers employees for their vote next week. But it would be an absolute shocker if the union came off the picket lines early without getting what they wanted.
Douglas County isn't opting out of free masks from the state after all, while supplies last. And teenagers at home, alone, with the Marshall Fire approaching. Once our like neighbor's lawn was on fire, we kind of realized, okay, like this isn't gonna be okay. Their escape and the lesson they hope is learned for next time. Colorado is giving away more than a million masks free of charge to those who receive them at sites across the state. The plan stumbled out of the gate because it was launched before some of those sites even realized that they were participating. Last night, right here, state health department said that they could not find a partner to opt in to give out masks in Douglas County. Not so fast, says the Douglas County Library System, which confirmed today that they are giving away masks at six of their locations. Castle Rock Fire is also participating, and Doug Coe says that masks are available at the Douglas County Fairgrounds from 10 to noon daily. Same for Sky Ridge Medical Center. Why a mask? Oh, I don't know. Maybe you don't want to get stuck in your home basement because somebody next to you uh, has contracted COVID and you've got mild symptoms. You don't want to expose your coworkers. That's why. State's positivity rate still sky high, more than 25%. We're coming down from 30%. Well, the snowfall winding down here in the backyard, but still going strong in and around the Eisenhower Johnson tunnels. Folks out there getting ready for the weekend and plenty of fresh powder. Already some clearing, as we can see, downtown Denver tonight. Eh, folks taking it slow, but the roads are wet and they will turn to ice overnight. We do have winter weather advisories going up in the foothills, about three to eight inches possible. And then also in south central Colorado for potentially four to eight inches. On HD Doppler 9, still watching kind of some drier air moving in. We're turning off the snowfall here in Denver, but still going strong up into the foothills and now finally South Central Colorado getting in on the action tonight. Single digits and teens up in the mountains will be in the teens here in uh, the Denver area, but everything really moving out by early tomorrow morning. The start of your weekend, plenty of sunshine out there. Things are looking pretty good. High pressure rolls back in and that keeps us nice and dry. And look at these temperatures seasonal. A nice change of pace as we head back to the 40s, 50s on Sunday before our next storm system arrives next week. Bowler County is shifting the focus of the Marshall fire response to long term recovery. The county is going to close its disaster assistance center in Lafayette tomorrow. The information available there will continue to be made available online. This happens as some families are just now beginning to come to grips with what they lost and how close they came to losing even more. Katie Eastman takes us to hear a family story in the Sagamore neighborhood, a neighborhood that's gone. I, well, yeah, I was like at the hotel laying in bed. I'm like, fingernail clippers. <laughs> Three weeks after losing their home. And then I'm like, Kristen Davis and her family keep remembering what they need. We're the best kiddo clippers I've ever had in my life. Little losses are an inconvenience. They were just so good. It's the big ones that make life a lot harder. But he doesn't speak. He um, has a cognitive delay. Uh, has a feeding tube. Um, when Brennan and his siblings evacuated their superior home in the Sagamore neighborhood, their mom was at work. Yeah, that was in a matter of five minutes. The kids called 911 just after noon when they saw the smoke. And then that was 1207. But say dispatchers didn't tell them what to do. Once our like neighbor's lawn was on fire, we kind of realized, okay, like this isn't going to be okay. So we didn't have time to grab anything. We just ran out the door and by the time we left, all of our neighbors' houses, like down the street, were already on fire. No warnings. So we had to drive through that. Their own instincts propelled them to go. I just like couldn't even think about all the things that I should have grabbed. They wish they could have grabbed the big stuff. He has a special bed he sleeps in um, because he gets up at night. He doesn't sleep very well. So since then, we haven't slept much this morning. Kristen says they also lost special wheelchairs, inserts for his shoes, and other things that make getting through life easier. It's going to be a a long haul, but I mean, just thinking where we've come so far from the last few weeks, it's definitely been a lot. Life might be harder for now, but they'll get by. Now we're kind of trying to recreate what we lost as far as rooms and and furniture. They'll and start to replace the big things and look for the little ones too, even those darn cuticle clippers. Maybe I'll find them. Katie Eastman. They were metal. Nine News. <laughs> 
We reached out to the Boulder Sheriff's Office to try and figure out why dispatchers might not have told the teenagers to evacuate. What they told us is that at the time the call came in from that house, there was not a mandatory evacuation for the Sagamore neighborhood. At that point in the process, they were telling people to leave if they felt unsafe. Do you have good news? It's a question we ask every Friday, a question for all ages. <laughs> no. That is an honest answer. More like it, some containing actual good news, because no one leaves here on Friday without a smile. Next. Gender reveal parties were interesting for a minute. Now it seems like they're always ending up as examples of how not to Colorado. Brian sent us photos from Cheeseman Park of what appears to be the remains of a gender reveal. It's a girl, and it's litter. Congrats, but I, come on, I'm happy for you, but, but do better by our beautiful state that you're bringing a kid into. That could have been this week's good news, but you had to get wild about it. Instead, we had to send our photojournalist Tom Cole with his camera and his favorite question to the National Western Stock Show. My good news is that this is my second year here for a field trip, and I'm with my buddies. I had fun spending time at the stock show. My good news is um, it's the first time that I've ridden a horse. Well, been on a horse. My good news is, my cousin won mutton busting for the first time. Uh, uh, and a couple years ago, I won too. The good news, whoa, well, we got to go to the petting zoo, and there's the saddles that we can ride on, and we can pretend like we're on real horses. And so there's this horse, and her name was Rainbow, and we got a petter. My good news is I have a dance competition this weekend. My good news is that I've been able to come to the stock show here with these kiddos and with my son. Oh my God. The alpacas came right up to our um, shoulders and ate out of our hands, huh? My good news is that I love doing the petty zoo because it's just so cute with the baby animals. They're so furry and I love them. Coming up after next, it is the fastest half hour in television, the National Western Junior Livestock Auction, this year featuring our own Steve Stager, who would acknowledge that his animal knowledge is middling at best. That's coming up at 6.30. Uh, your feedback tonight is a little harsh in the appearance department, but we'll have that plus something that's not horrible next. <laughs> It's everyone's favorite segment now. Here's something that isn't horrible. Barb sent us a video from Parker, grandson Peyton playing with his new golden retriever puppy, Thor. You got a baby, you got a puppy, both not horrible, on the news. So we're trying to balance the scale for you. Send us anything that's not horrible. Email next at 9news.com or use the hashtag HeyNext. Beth writes in in feedback, hope you're okay. Not only are you having some connectivity issues, but you look really pale. Yeah, Beth, I would say this whole situation is suboptimal on a number of levels, uh, but I appreciate your fine eye for detail. MB says, what happens to the grand champion and other livestock winners tonight? Breeding or... or? Stay tuned for the Junior Livestock Auction, and I'll see you next time.